So, hi. Um, welcome to our Drupal session. Um, this is Women in Tech, um, how to get and keep women in your leadership roles. Um, so thank you all for joining us for the first session today. It's quite early. Um, we do have a remote presenter. Um, so Jen will introduce herself if it's 1 a.m. her time, but thank you very much, Jen. Um, so today we're just going to do some quick intros. Um, we're going to talk about how we're defining leadership in this session. Uh, we'll, like from the three panelists, we're going to have just an overview of um, our experiences as women in leadership roles and challenges as it relates to leadership. Um, we're going to talk about why these experiences are so common. Um, and this will be a bit interactive, so feel free to um, participate. Um, and then, so after questions, we're going to just summarize with um, takeaways and then like real um, world examples. Uh, we have a lot of resources um, that we'll be sharing with this presentation um, with the real world examples. So we're, we're kind of gloss over those during the session. Um, but we also have um, a Google spreadsheet of um, other additional resources because there is a ton of material um, that mm -hmm. we'd love to share with you guys. And we will share the deck as well. So if there's anything in the slide deck that you Great. So, um, so I'm Lindsay Catlett. Uh, I'm a Google architect um, with Google Brands, which is uh, it's a Fortune 100 product company. Um, previously, um, I worked at Alphabet for a number of years in various technical roles. Um, I've also worked in consulting um, as an engineer at Intel. Um, and then also on political campaigns. Um, and I've been a contributor to Drupal and op other open source projects for about 10 years now. So my name's Ruth Jeesley. I'm the Mortic Community Manager at Acquia. Previous to that, I founded and grew a full service agency for about seven years. And I've been involved in open source for about 18 years. I've been on the leadership team of the Joomla project for uh, just over three years. So, yeah, that's my background. And then joining us uh, remotely is uh, Jen Schramm. Hi, everyone. I'm Jen Franick, and I'm the Delect Director of Learning Services at Acquia, where I've worked for about the past eight years. Prior to that, I served in project and program management roles and as the Director of Operations, and I'm currently a board president for a nonprofit called the Hispanic Rescue Program in San Francisco. I'm here remotely from California because family responsibilities kept me home, um, but I really wanted to participate, so I'm happy to be able to join this way. Oh, uh, we've, Jen actually pre-recorded um, her um, her comments just in case we get technical problems. <laughs> so, um, so what do we mean by women in leadership? Um, so we don't mean just being in a leadership or management role, um, but really leading and um, encouraging others throughout their career, um, and like really setting gender diversity strategy for a team or organization. And not only that, but just um, owning um, the delivery of the strategic gender objectives, uh, like in the long term. Um, so given that. Um, how many of you guys uh, consider yourself to be a woman in leadership? Oh, just one? Okay. That's very interesting. We'll talk about that more. Um, so, um, we have an additional question. Um, so, which of the following... Um, Sorry, which, which of the following describes how um, you feel your company or organization supports women in leadership roles throughout their career? So we have four different options here. So super confident, um, okay, needs help, or I'm not sure. So how many of you guys would say super confident? Just one? How about okay? Well, it depends a little bit. Yeah, exactly. Um, talking about leadership in, in terms of managing, manager as a function, then no, but as a person who needs a group, then yes, definitely. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a great point. Um, so how many would say it's just okay? Yeah. And how about needs help? Or you're not sure. Okay. Um, yeah, so uh, we're all going to share um, our experiences uh, as it relates to um, leadership and gender diversity as well as challenges uh, that we've encountered throughout our careers. But um, just a general disclaimer, um, we don't want you to be discouraged by any sort of, uh, any of our stories uh, that may seem unfortunate. Um, 
like in this panel, or this session, we should really be able to talk openly about um, our own paths, uh, both good and bad, and that also does not imply that that's the only path to leadership. Um, and just because you've never experienced something that um, we or yourselves um, uh, or other people in the room have um, commented on or talked about, that doesn't mean that it is not happening. Um, so uh, my experience in tech, um, I got in tech um, kind of in a non-traditional background. Um, I started working on political campaigns um, and very few um, female role models, uh, both on when I was working on campaigns and then also throughout my career. Um, this was kind of in the Howard Dean era of Drupal. Um, so as I got more involved with Drupal and open source um, and moved to more um, you know, tech-centric roles or develop, developer roles, I was really reluctant to um, take leadership roles and like challenge the status quo uh, until really being encouraged by mentors and other allies. Um, as far as challenges, uh, finding a mentor and support network, um, that was it took me a while to do that. Um, I definitely have um, had and had and probably still had imposter syndrome, probably like many of you, um, especially as it relates to um, contributing to um, public open source projects or public and other open source projects. Um, and if you're not familiar with that term, that's uh, when a person really doubts their accomplishments um, and they have like kind of an internalized fear of exposing themselves as a fraud to others. Um, and then also, like I've uh, struggled in the past um, where I've had to come to terms with how like achieving the best leadership positions may actually mean leading an organization at times. Yeah, so um, also my route to IT has been somewhat untraditional. I trained as a physiotherapist and then I ended up uh, building websites in my spare time uh, working in IT. But as a, when I was at school, like science and technology careers just weren't, it, they were kind of saying, oh yeah, you could do this, but there was just no practical support. I wanted to be an engineer and I ended up in a design office and I just can't draw, you know, like, and all my male friends were um, in engineering workshops and stuff like that. Um, so, so from my perspective, I got into this mainly through open source, actually, through getting involved with the junior project. Um, and it wasn't until someone actually, so I was starting to build websites, I was building a business while working full time, and to, to get the clients I went and spoke at some conferences. And it wasn't until um, some, another woman in leadership, Diane Henning, she came up to me and she said, like, I've heard you talking, I know you run a user group locally, I think you'd be really great on our community leadership team, and I really want to nominate you. And my first response was like, I'm not a leader, like how can I be a leader? Um, and she really took me under her, under her wing and gave me a lot of support and mentoring to kind of come into that role. So like, I didn't actually believe in my own ability um, and I still struggle with that. Each step up the rung I go, it's like, I can't do that role, how can I do that role? Um, so yeah, and also I live with a long-term disability. So for me, as I take more responsibility, it cannot be at the, um, it cannot be the case that that means I have to work more hours or you know, put my health at risk because I just won't be able to work optimally. So understanding my needs and having the confidence to be vulnerable like at the job interview stage and say, I need these certain conditions to function, um, that has been a huge challenge for me. And supportive networks, I think we all found that supportive networks to help you um, get to that point and have somewhere to sound off if you're struggling. That's also been really important for me. Um, and then moving to okay. Jen. <coughs> well, okay. So I first got into technology by virtue of a nonprofit background. And I was sort of the most technical person at the nonprofit. So I ended up setting up other people's email addresses and helping them use their computers and things like that. Um, and that was in my early career. And I later moved into managing web application projects for nonprofit organizations because I understood them and, um, and I also understood tech. And then finally I moved into open source and into Drupal and eventually to Orthopia. Uh, as I was coming up in my career, I definitely had my fair share of challenges. And like many of you, I experienced imposter syndrome and really feeling out of place in the tech arena from my nonprofit background. I felt out of place for that reason. And being a woman in tech, where there were very few of them. Um, 
I was a new mom for a period of time there and navigating my work and my career and looking for flexibility. And since about 2004, I've also been an entirely remote worker. So I worked for three different companies where I worked from home. So working from home can have a lot of challenges just by itself, really with being visible, you know, showing up on people's radar when things they're asking to do. And um, it is definitely hard to speak up and get attention sometimes in, in meetings when you're women, uh, but it can be even harder when you're about remote women <laughs> and cut calling in from home. So uh, that's definitely part of my earlier career. And then um, what I ended up needing in the end was, was really mentorship, and it took me a while to figure it out, but I did eventually figure it out. So how many people in the room have experienced similar challenges? The ones we, probably everyone. Yeah. yeah. Um, so why does this happen? I think everyone in the room um, has been impacted by it. It's one of the things that um, that we talked about, and I'm sure you have additional challenges to add. Uh, so we've tried to boil um, the experiences of all women in the world down to seven bullet points. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, so we, we took a stab at doing that. Um, so uh, what we think this really comes down to is a number of things. Uh, it's lack of role models, so lack of uh, women in existing uh, leadership positions, and not just women, but also allies who are supportive of gender diversity, uh, empowering women. Um, there can be a lack of flexible um, and supportive conditions uh, that are um, you know, appealing or, or required by many women. Um, there, a lot of organizations or teams um, or managers can um, really not be great at giving feedback. Um, it can be really insufficient at a lot of organizations, um, and also training as well. Like many managers um, and leaders, they really don't get um, training that's um, either required or encouraged by their organization or teams uh, on um, gender diversity and uh, the importance. Uh, and then there can really be uh, a lack of awareness. Um, at many companies um, of the benefits of gender diversity. And this can be, um, I mean, it, there's so much research that discusses uh, the, just the benefits of gender diversity and like these teams tend to be more productive, they can, tend to be more innovative and collaborative. Um, and like at the end of the day, that can be much better um, for businesses in general. Um, uh, so skip ahead. So there can also be uh, just a lack of visibility at many organizations, uh, and uh, you know among colleagues and to existing experiences, and like many people are not even aware um, that there could be an issue um, with gender diversity on their team or organization. Um, and then I've um, at least throughout my career, I've also seen that um, there could be a reluctance at some organizations to really acknowledge. Um, or accept existing problems and then take the necessary like actionable steps to address them because in many cases that can mean that um, or that means that they're uh, they have to acknowledge the problem and there can be some hesitance at many uh, organizations to do that yeah, yeah. so you mentioned um, in your introduction about open source communities um, what, do you, what role do you think open source communities can play in kind of Challenging that, or in, mm -hmm. in addressing the diversity issues in companies. Um, so, in in my experience, like getting more active in open source, uh, that really uh, it took me a while to, to do that, um, but it exposed me uh, and it, like introduced me to so many people that I otherwise wouldn't have met, uh, and not just the people themselves, but their experiences, and also um, in many cases, like I could hear about the culture at their companies and like. I think, at least for me, um, I, I worked at um, you know an organization for a number of years, and I think I had started to normalize certain behaviors because I didn't even know um, that like there was a, there was a problem because I wasn't hearing about other organizations and about how conditions were there. So, and not just like hearing about the experiences, I also learned about other leadership opportunities um, and, and other roles at other companies as well. Um, and like I think that like. That, I mean, that's how I ended up in my position now. Uh, I found out you know, from talking to people in the Drupal community, uh, it wasn't something that I actively sought out, but uh, like, I think um, that also speaks to the power of just 
networking and you know um, it's one of the things I love about Drupal is there is such a community centric you know and I guess many open source communities um, but yeah so like I, I definitely wouldn't be um, where I am today without open source <laughs> and I think my experience as well is that um, that there were some amazing, so our first world conference in June where we had 24% women attendance without, without there being a huge diversity campaign, that's just what happened, we weren't happy with that. Um, but then having other women who are willing to kind of bring, bring people in as contributors, that for me personally I find that really helpful. I don't really have any issues working with guys but it was just a different approach and for me it was like reaching out the hand to like you know, you're reaching up to people to help you, but also you can reach down to people who are like newer than you and bring them along with you. And that really is exemplified, I think, in open source. No, so you mentioned, um, you know, working with a disability. So, in, in what ways, from your perspective, can a company um, uh, provide support for those living, not just uh, living with a disability, but um, also? Ensuring that you can be productive and happy. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I think so. I think there's two sides to the coin. I think um, you need to be self-aware enough to know what your needs are to work at full capacity to be a happy, healthy human being, and that takes a little bit of self-awareness and compassion for yourself. And I think typically, my experience is that women tend to be quite strongly conditioned by our culture that everyone else's needs are more important than ours. And as you come up into leadership roles, my experience is that it is much more demanding of you physically, emotionally, mentally, just like in every way. And if your basic needs are not being met, how are you ever going to thrive in a leadership role without burning out? Um, so I think from an individual perspective, it's like knowing what your needs are. So for me, it's I need flexible working, I need to have a half day in the middle of the week where I can crash if I need to recover and continue. Um, but also being willing to be vulnerable at some point in that process, whether it's right at the start or whether it's when you're getting off of the job and saying, absolutely, I love this job, but these are my requirements. I'm really standing firm with that. And companies, I think, need to... Uh, find ways to allow people to have that conversation early. Or if something changes in their life, if they have children, if they have a caring responsibility at home, but they have the opportunity regularly, and they don't feel like that's going to jeopardize their career or their leadership, but actually it's a positive thing. Like I want to be working at full capacity, I want to be able to bring my whole self to this role, but to do that I need some flexibility. Um, to make sure I don't burn out, I need some flexibility. And for me, that's been key. And I actually lost jobs. They literally retracted the offer. And I said, I can't do nine to five, two hours commute each way. Like, I physically can't do that. They said, sorry, we can't have you in this role. I'm like, really? <laughs> like, huge enterprises. Really? In this day and age? You're lost. Like, you've lost me as an, as an asset to your business. That's fine. But, but I have felt, felt that I really had to put my needs first. Yeah. yeah. Uh so Jen, you um, talked about how important mentorship was in um, you gaining leadership roles. So like, what are your recommendations for um, finding and like being a mentor? That is a good question. So for me, um, I, it took me a while to figure out what I needed with mentorship. So I had my imposter syndrome telling me, you don't belong here anyway. So. I, in a lot of ways, was just happy to play any role that I had, just getting the experience and living the dream in San Francisco and all that. Um, but eventually, uh, my knowledge caught up with me, and, and I got a really strong desire to play a more strategic role in the work that I was doing and to sort of design the work that I was doing, have more, more say. Um, I was frustrated for a while by the fact that I was not being promoted, but I didn't recognize at the time that that was more my fault than anyone else's because I just was not really understanding how to be in the driver's seat of my own career at that point. Um, I was lucky enough to be a company that had an apprenticeship program, and so I was able to take advantage of those. And I went to a company that had a management consulting team that worked with us for a year. It was a really great opportunity. But I, and I learned a lot from that, but I still, um, still didn't quite click until I chose my own mentor. And that ended up being a, a male mentor at, uh, at Acquia, who still was there and still kind of served in a role. 
um, then he's somebody who really got me and understood me and, and what I wanted to contribute and how I could contribute more so than I did. I think he believed in me and what I could add more than I did for a long time. And he just showed me more of how the path to advancement was in my hands and not so much in the control of everyone else but the way I had kind of thought it and, and just taught me how to operate the career ladder better and um, understand what it was people were looking for and people that they advanced. And I was doing all those things, I was just very bad at bragging about it, which ended up being, for me, the thing I really needed to learn, which is stop with the, the humility and the downplaying of the contributions mm -hmm. I was making and just knowing how to, how to talk about them more, more like men do. <laughs> you know, they brag, and, you know, talk in the locker room about all the great accomplishments they have, and I just needed to be a little bit more like that. Mm -hmm. oh, it's actually interesting, because um, I think Jen and I, um, discovered that same mentor around the same time. And it, he's still my mentor, even um, uh, having left off with um, But it just, uh, I think we both kind of um, struggled with a lot of the same things, and he really um, elevated us individually, um, like for our individual strengths. Uh, but he also like really helped us um, work together in the best way. Um, which like, was really a really great experience. Yeah, he found a great male ally uh, stick with them because they tend to help other you know, they tend to be the, the people behind a lot of women advancing. Mm -hmm. And you identify somebody who is the first woman in your organization. And I think that peer support as well of like having other women, maybe not even in your company, but having other women who are at roughly the same level of career with roughly similar kind of um, ambitions or um, you know that you're sort of like struggling with the same things that can be so valuable, not only from like just having a, a comrade in arms, but also, like you were saying, um, having examples of maybe other businesses where they're getting something that's really helping them, helping them, and you can kind of then ask for that in your role. But if you don't have those relationships with other people, you may not even know that that is something that would be helpful to you, and mentors are good as well. And, Yeah, so we wanted to um, kind of open up the floor uh, for any um, questions either to us or to each other. Um, I mean, we like, are there any comments that anyone would like to make? You can come up to the mic if you want, because then other people can hear it. I think it's pretty small. OK. Uh, it's not a question, but it's a yeah. um, So uh, it's not a question, but I think one point that we missed in your four points is society. Um, I come from India. Mm -hmm. I didn't have, forget about uh, leadership roles. I didn't have women who had careers to look forward. Yeah. So that kind of a thing, I think we have this, and we should really talk about that as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's an excellent point. And, and so that just, like um, like you said, like it's that's a cultural societal yeah. issue, and that's something that at least I myself have not necessarily had the experience. Mm -hmm. uh, so thank you for commenting yeah. on that. I think in my family experience, um, uh, so my mother worked when I was at school, but from her backwards, every other woman in our family has been housewife. So for me, for example, yeah. I was the first working woman in both the sides of families. Yeah. So that was itself was a big struggle. Yeah, 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 yeah. And sometimes I find I, I bear a lot of responsibility on my shoulders, and my sister also, who is a quite high up in HR, of like, so much expectation is being put yeah. on us as women and as career women to be it, be it all and do it all. And actually sometimes that is really like a big stick to beat myself with, so I'm not good enough, which plays into the imposter syndrome as well. Yeah. Uh, to, so sometimes it's also like for me, do I really need at this stage of my career to be like pushing myself to the next stage? Or do I just actually need to get settled here? Like, what is it that's driving me? Is it anxiety that I'm not doing good enough, or is it genuinely like I feel ready to move forward? So. Any other comments or questions? I sometimes struggle with um, identifying with a woman. I am a woman, of course. Uh, but I'm also the girl with the brown hair and the brown eyes and with the MacBook laptop. And if I propose a session, uh, or it's also a proposing a session, I want them to choose me because I'm good, not by the fact that I'm a female. But if we also uh, choose the female in this case, because she's a female and we want to increase the diversity, we are retaining the gap a little bit. Yeah. So how, how would you recommend? 
Bridging this gap. I mean, it's, at least for me personally, at the end of the day, if, if <laughs> someone is chosen for a panel or hired um, who doesn't have the right skill set, it's it's to me it's almost, and they happen to be a woman, um, and it was, you know, like I said, diversity hire. To me, that's actually setting, I think, uh, women in the movement a bit back. <laughs> yeah, it's setting you up to fail. Yeah. And that's your really shit heart at getting up very quickly. <laughs> right. Um, I mean, I, I think Ruth, you commented the other day that um, you've been selected for a panel um, for just being a woman, and you actually said no. Yeah. Well, I, I said no, and I explained why I said no, because I'm not, I'm not willing to be on the panel because I'm a woman. I'm willing to be on the panel because I'm a technically competent person who can give really interesting views and what have you. Um, and it is also nice, the fact that we have more diversity. But leading with, we need more women on the panel, uh, yeah, no. <laughs> but it's an opportunity. Some people would just find that way too triggering and teasing to deal with. But for me, I approach it as an opportunity to educate. And that person genuinely, genuinely did not realize how uh, that can be received by women. I didn't even think it was an issue because he knows I'm really passionate about women in tech. He's like, hey, we need a woman on the panel, would you be willing to join? Um, but I also found a comment in 2012 when I said about the World Conference only having, only having 24% women, where I actually said exactly what you said. I don't think we want to have women keynoting at the World Conference if they're not competent as a keynote speaker, because that is really detrimental in so many ways. You know, we need to be nurturing people so that they are then competent, and then yes, absolutely. But yeah, you have to, there's a fine line between uh, mm -hmm. putting someone into a bar and letting them grow and they're not quite ready, mm -hmm. or like throwing them in the fire and letting them burn. Um, and uh, I chaired the board of the, the association. 
Uh, and uh, I've, I've heard your question as, as sort of uh, you know, leadership roles is, is um, I certainly heard it as we think about sort of recruitment and nominations for other board members. Mm -hmm. um, and I wasn't quite hearing it in that dimension. That dimension makes obviously sense too. Um, and I, I know that when we sit down to talk about um, you know, nominations and reviews, uh, one of the things that we do is, is we set, uh, we, we've long had a goal of uh, gender parity on the board. Um, and, uh, and that's something that we've had for quite a while. Mm -hmm. And what we, at least what we found, is that it's not immediate like once we get to that parity, but as long as it becomes sort of the, uh, the norm, mm -hmm. then it becomes much easier to identify people of, of much more different backgrounds and sort of the, the diversity of the board and this time experience has, has grown from there. So it's kind of like getting to critical mass mm -hmm. then helped us not only stay but accelerate in terms of that critical mass. Um, so mm -hmm. and I also wanted to just um, speak to there's uh, I'm also a professor. Um, and um, uh, and mentoring is one of those areas that I look at. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to echo your comments around, um, there's actually research out there that looks at sort of um, uh, 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 sex and gender of, uh, of on the mentor side. And what you're saying is exactly right. Sometimes you find male mentors who are who are really aware and are willing to promote and pick up that kind of a reputation, mm -hmm. and then obviously they, they tend to people tend to tend to, they tend to gravitate towards them. Mm -hmm. um, and um, uh, and but certainly, are there sort of enough male you know, allies to answer to that in the research is basically no, mm -hmm. but it seems to be growing. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks, yeah, that's very yeah. Yeah. yeah, so um, I, I know we've talked about a lot of topics, uh, but just um, kind of to summarize, I think, um, mm -hmm. our takeaways from this session, um, like, I think one of them is definitely to invite feedback um, and experience sharing. Uh, I mean, so there we have some examples of uh, not so great feedback. <laughs> so this is a word cloud of actual words um, that have been um, as feedback, at least for myself, <laughs> um, in, in various points in my career. Um, so, like this, these type of words, um, at least the problem that I have with them is that it's calling out a behavior without um, a clear example of what the preferred, um, like, behavior should be, <laughs> um, and to fulfill job responsibilities. These could also just be um, more related to someone's personality. I mean, some of these words I also think are very sexist. <laughs> and that's that's my opinion. Uh, but just like the like when some of these phrases have been used um, as feedback for myself, like very rarely do they actually come with actionable insight as well as to how to improve. Um, and like that, I think is much more productive um, and valuable feedback. Um, has it, can anyone else relate to these type of words? Um, and I don't think strong will is ever <laughs> but um, yeah so um, oh also so it can also be pretty valuable in many cases to open up opportunities for anonymous feedback I know there was one case or one uh, story like so Nike actually did this um, they opened up um, like or they sent out um, like an anonymous survey for like their more rank and file um, employees to provide feedback on their um, executive and other leadership, and that actually revealed some pretty serious um, misconduct that had, that uh, many were completely unaware of, um, resulted in some pretty high profile um, dismissals. Um, yeah. Any? Do you have any other feedback on just? Yeah, I mean, I think, <laughs> so I think we can get sucked into this all being right work, but I think it's really important when you have people in leadership roles in open source projects that you actually treat that as if it was a workplace as well. And, and so, like, you actually have the opportunity for there to be reviews for people who are in leadership 
whether it's with someone else in the team, like a peer review, or someone else further up the chain. And that also gives them the opportunity to say, actually, I'm finding this really difficult, and is there any way people can support me? Um, but I've, yeah, so I've also had, uh, certainly in my earlier career, um, some of those words used. Rightfully so, because I was really quite uh, unaware of the way my communication comes across to others. Um, but like you, so some people have given me that kind of feedback and they've been really constructive. They've been like, you have to stop saying that because you're coming across as being really arrogant. Maybe you could communicate it more like this so that you achieve the same outcome, but people aren't quite as pissed off. Um, and that was really helpful feedback. Like, it was like, you're doing something that's not good, but here's a way that you could maybe try and practice. Because when you're coming up into leadership, you're kind of practicing and it's going to be clunky, and you're going to be bumping up and doing things wrong, and often really publicly. So, um, yeah, that's my experience. I don't know if Jen, if you have any thoughts on that as well. Can you repeat can yeah. the question? We'll echo it. Oh, um, well, I think my actual question, do you have any feedback on how to get better feedback? <laughs> but um, just ways, um, ways to give very valuable feedback as a mentor or a leader. The only thing I would add to what I heard you guys say was just um, when and if you do become a leader, remember remember the little people, remember how you felt coming up and what kind of feedback you would have needed to hear. I think um, when I have shared feedback with people that was very actionable, they are really appreciative of having something specific to work on. Um, there's a lot of vagueness in trying for promotions. And there's sort of like a lot of what feel like unwritten rules or um, you know, insider information, and so to, to the extent that you can help people navigate that, it's really helpful for them. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I think definitely one of the takeaways um, is to find a mentor um, who is not only you look up to, but it's definitely been a proven example of um, what you think is successful leadership. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and don't be afraid to actually approach someone and yeah. talk to them. Like they're just people that yeah, they might be an amazing leader, but they're just a person. And, mm -hmm. you know, connect with them. Yeah, um, and then we um, we especially spoke to this earlier. Um, just knowing what you need to be successful, and then really not being afraid to ask for it, whether it's yeah. in the interview process or in um, your current position. Um, I think, like at least in my experience, I've just like, I have had a tendency to just kind of deal with things mm -hmm. and be like, oh, well, that's how it is, and um, you can't get, yeah. you know. Um, and nervous. I think, like, presenteeism is so rife in leadership. Like, people end up working crazy, crazy hours just because they're so ineffective, because they're so exhausted. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's just like, you just need to reset and say, no, I'm working nine to five. Because all the people are looking at you as a role model, whether you know it or not. And if you're modeling that behavior, they're thinking, like, there's no way I could do that. Mm -hmm. Or they're thinking, okay, that's how I have to behave. So it's also mm -hmm. like taking the um, initiative. Um, so another thing that I think um, is really, really pretty clear um, throughout the session is just to be an ally to women in the workplace. I, I think, um, I mean, I'm a naturally competitive person anyway, um, but I think, uh, it, like, to me now, it's not that it's like me against everyone else. It's more mm -hmm. just you know find your team, <laughs> yeah. you know, mm -hmm. um, and support them when they need support. Yeah. Um, so something else um, that I think is pretty important is to just if you are in a leadership or decision making role, like create opportunities um, for women to you know per, you know participate in panels or go to conferences. Um, to like go from training and um, or create opportunities for yourself to get training. Mm -hmm. um, and I've had cases where I've asked to go to uh, like a women in tech event, and it's been like, well, why would you want to go to that? You're doing like health informatics. Why do you want to go to something about? And it's because I want to be with other women in tech in a safe environment. Or maybe I want to. When I first started speaking at conferences. I went and spoke at women conferences because that's where I felt comfortable, that was my safe space. 
and then I grew to be able to speak at a conference like you know like this where I don't know anyone and it's a mixed audience and they're my peers. So it's also like realizing when someone's asking for something like this, it, it may well be that that's what they need to take the next step and just being supportive of that. Mm -hmm. <coughs> oh, and so the uh, Drupal um, community, or the Drupal Association rather, uh, they, they have created many opportunities. Uh, so there's uh, the Drupal, um, there's an inclusion fund um, that um, provides funding to women or other under, underrepresented groups to attend things um, uh, like DrupalCon. And it also provides them like mentorship opportunities and you know, help if they the first time speaking. Uh, there's a Women in Drupal luncheon today. Um, I think it might be um, sold out, or I think it might be fully reserved already. Um, but I definitely encourage um, those mm -hmm. to attend who did sign up. Yeah. Um, but yeah, and like um, I think you mentioned earlier, so a lot of conferences that do require um, you know at least one woman on a panel, and it's not to say that um, you know you should select someone because they're not technically competent, <laughs> like or just because they're a woman and they don't have the technical skills. But I mean, I think it is definitely. Um, progress in making um, yeah. very panels and other conferences more gender diverse. And any conference I go to, I kind of have a little yeah. unofficial aim to try and inspire at least one other person, one other woman, to speak at the next version of that conference because I think that's really important as well, like giving people that vote of confidence that they can do it and being like, drop me an email if you want to practice your talk or something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I mean, and yeah, it speaks to our next uh, takeaway find that group of like minded people. Um, not just women, but you know, people. Yeah, people. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, career support groups can be very helpful as well. amount of resources that we compiled. Uh, it's uh, bit.ly WFT resources. Um, this is just a Google Sheet. Um, it actually might be a good idea if we make that editable and yeah. people can add to that. Um, maybe at the monthly, um, you know, unofficial DrupalCon, or I guess official DrupalCon <laughs> on the women in tech resources. Um, yeah, so we can do that. But um, yeah, we definitely encourage you to check out those resources. I know we skipped over a bunch of um, the real world examples, but like again, we'll share this deck. Um, and this was recorded as well. Um, but yeah, thank you all for attending. Thank you, Jen. Thank you. You can go back to bed now, Jen. Yeah, you can go to bed.